What do you mean we can't talk about Big World Big Avengers? I thought it was coming out on a US DVD. Oh, I see. Why don't we talk about Season 22 instead? My Little Pony Season 8? Oh, you gotta be kidding me! What am I gonna do for Episode 7? Oh... Oh, the pain! It's unbearable! Jesus, jumped up Christ, Mike! What happened to you? You remember the last episode? Where I started a bath for Matt? Yeah, why? Well... Yeah, I don't want to talk about it. As if my luck couldn't get any worse. Nothing to talk about for episode 7. No pony else to share their thoughts with. I'm right here. Oh yeah, there's Matt. But we still don't have a third person to talk with. Jeez Louise, Mike. What happened to you? Don't ask. Well, there is this one thing I want to talk about for a while now. But it wouldn't be much fun with just me and Matt. Not to worry. I brought a friend who is currently my caretaker. I guess I shall introduce her. What do you think? Go ahead. You know what they say, the more the merrier! Okay, join Zach and Matt for this episode as our good friend and my current caretaker, Toby and Mavis Forever. Also known to us as Rachel. Rachel! You're gonna join us? Indeed I am, Matt. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel, and I'll be filling in for Mike Walsh. He's, uh... In dispars. Now come on, Mike. It's time to get some rest. And remember what I said about those ice packs, okay? Okay. At least I'll be able to rest up for a Big World Big Adventures review. Wait a moment. I thought you said that Episode 7 was about Big World Big Adventures. Um, yeah. About that. See, we can't review the movie yet because A, it won't be on DVD until September in Australia. B, I don't want to rely on poorly recorded footage from a movie theater because that would be stupid. And C, Mattel have a terrible distribution strategy. Great. The DVD hasn't been released in the UK yet, and North America isn't going to get it for who knows how long. That's just peachy. Oh, now come on, guys. We could try and tackle something else. Like, maybe tackle MLP and Thomas together on a broader scale? On a broader scale? How so? Perhaps a trope related to both. I've been hearing the villain redemption trope's been getting overused lately. No kidding. That is something I really want to tear to shreds. For obvious reasons, I bet. Yeah. Go to the intro! Oh, I got a place in the intro! Sweet! <laughs> I've made it no secret in the past that I hate the villain redemption trope. Goes like this. Our heroes of the movie, episode, special, whatever you like to call it, are battling our villain of the week. And sometimes it turns out that they have a backstory that forces the audience to sympathize with them. I definitely don't, especially if said villain has been shown doing despicable things like murder and whatnot. Then we get a supposedly heartwarming speech about friendship and then the villain stops doing whatever evil deeds they were doing and join the heroes. Happy ending all around. <sighs> I can understand where you're coming from, Zack. If the tropes rush, the plot can lead to a jumbled mess. And no doubt there are a large number of examples of it. Not only in My Little Pony, but even in Thomas and Friends. Even though it is less frequent in the Thomas series. But what is it about that trope that really gets my goat? Well, let's go back to 2013 for the first Equestria Girls film, shall we? After all, everything has to start somewhere. Oh, the first film. In this film, we are introduced to Sunset Shimmer, who is Celestia's former pupil before suddenly vanishing to the human world. Full story on that is shown in The Fall of Sunset Shimmer. And if I recall Mike telling me correctly, someone has a huge crush on her. Uh, what? Who? I don't know what you're talking about. Don't deny it, Zack. Shut up. Just shut up. Anyway, she returns to Equestria to steal Twilight's element so she can take over. Unfortunately for Sunset, Twilight and Spike jump in after her, and they are fish out of water for the majority of the film. And she gets a crush on Flash Sentry upon meeting him. Cue fans who pair Twilight with other characters, or themselves, going into a rage. Enough to last many years. 
Hey, Mike, they brought in a character we know you love. Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> okay, I admit that was funny. Oh, my. Well, I didn't pair Twilight and Flash at first, but Zack's fan fictions have made it grow on me, as well as Flash himself. Sunset that does everything she can to make Twilight look bad so she can be Princess of the Fall formal. And it turned out that the Humane Five have been in a feud because of Sunset messing up the freshman fair, or something like that. Again, full story on that is in the comics. Adding a reason to why I hate the first movie. But Twilight ends up becoming Princess of Fall Formal in the end, just mere minutes before the portal closes for another 30 moods. I don't know how time in this series works, but I'm assuming that's either a month or two and a half years. Take your pick. With Applejack having a family reunion every hundred moons during Friendship is Magic Part 1 and Apple Family Reunion, and they seemingly take place close enough for Twilight to have been a princess about a year after coming to Ponyville, I can't even guess. However, Sunset wasn't quite done just yet. She had an ace up her sleeve. Was she hiding something up there? It would seem so. I was being sarcastic. Well, excuse me! For what? Trying to avoid blowing up over something I hate? Whoa, whoa, whoa! Calm the heck down, gentlemen! I can see why Mike said you were a handful. Anyway, where exactly were we again? A demon. I turned into a raging she-demon. Oh, right. And that was when she got hold of the crown and put it on her head. And Sunset was crying while transforming. Did any of you guys notice that? That's kind of a blink and you miss moment. Never really occurred to me whenever I watch it. Either way, Sunset, now a she-demon, then tries to roast Twilight alive. But then suddenly, they pony up and bring her back to normal. And she's in tears. Not much of a battle if you ask me. Nope. The good news is that it did eventually make way for Rainbow Rocks where she was properly redeemed not only in the eyes of the audience, but her peers as well. The bad news? Well, you know how Mr. Andrew goes on about the likes of Shrek, Ren and Stimpy, and South Park being negative influences on media, however great their reception? This is how I feel about Sunset Shimmer being a negative influence in the Equestria Girls series. And before anyone sends me hate comments, keep in mind you can love something and still find problems with it, and vice versa. I personally love Rainbow Rocks. Sunset's redemption was very well executed, and she became a really cool character. Rainbow Rocks was also what got me liking Sunset Shimmer very much. However, that would soon all change. How so, Matt? We go from an improvement to the first film, to the best, in my opinion, of the Equestria Girls film series. The Friendship Games! I wouldn't go as far to calling it one of the best, I'm afraid. Why not? It has Sunset at her best. It gives her a new outfit, and it also gives her a new super form. Well, Sunset was portrayed pretty good, Mad Sure, well, but and... there's a new oh, oh. in the room we can't overlook. What on God's green earth is a story about Sideswai learning about magic, doing it in a movie that's supposed to relate to sports? I thought that movie was called Friendship Games, for goodness sake. Though well, why it has that title when the games are anything but friendly is beyond me, but I digress. Uh, yes, Zach, but you do make a point that- All stories need a conflict. Granted, but this would have worked way better if it focused on competition between the schools, but that's not what I really want to address here. For the most part of the film, Principal Abacus Singe is depicted as being the antagonist. Many people hate her, but here's the thing, she's intentionally written to be unlikable. Oh, uh, well, yes, Abacus Singe But then suddenly some random demon oh. shimmer ripoff, sorry, I mean Midnight Sparkle, comes literally from nowhere and nearly destroys the gates between Equestria and the human world. That's my favorite part of the film. Well, uh, I like the part t The t true main well, antagonist uh, oh, shows oh. herself, attempting <gasps> to destroy the current dimension to reach Equestria. It was as if Saitwai was unleashing all of her inner pain after a long time of being seen as useless by her peers at Crystal Prep. Ah, <sighs> uh, okay. Now everything's less and quiet, I guess I can input something. The real point of the special is the reformed antagonist, being the Shadowbolts in this case. But there's not much build up to that, I'm afraid. Yeah, all they do is just stand there and act like one dimensional snobs. You could swap any of the Shadowbolt 5 out with any of the background Shadowbolts and nothing would change. Like, is there anything about those five that makes them even the tiniest bit interesting? Anything at all? I've got nothing. I'm 
kind of drawing a blank here. They do a very bare minimal distinction, but that's about it. It's possible because the main focus from Crystal Prep are actually both Principal Cinch and Sci-Twi. And that's the problem. The Shadow Ball 5 changed their tone after Sci-Twi returns back to normal for no reason whatsoever. If you want your character to have a heel face turn, they need to tell us why, as audience members, we should care for them. And they don't. They tell us so little about the Shadow Ball 5 as individuals that were never given a reason to care for them. Their later appearance in Dance Magic, well, for them at least, still doesn't give anyone a reason to care. TWO YEARS AFTER FRIENDSHIP GAMES! There's no excuse. They seen again in Dance Magic? Gosh, I need to keep up! Was that a spoiler? Oh, don't worry, Matt. I'm not that fussed with spoilers. Oh, good. That being said, Friendship Games is Oscar-worthy compared to the film that came after it. And it is also the point that the spin-off drove itself into a hole it could never, ever, ever climb out of. Ugh, legend of Everfree. Many of us know what makes this film a giant turd, but we're not going to talk about that. Besides Sideswine and that terrible excuse for a Flash Century replacement known as Timber Spruce, the third ever significant character of the film deserves a shredding. Gloriosa Daisy. First off, let's look at previous antagonistic motivations, shall we? Sunset wanted the fame and recognition she was denied in Equestria. The Dazzlings brainwashed most of CHS to feed off negative energy. Cinch wanted to cheat her way to maintain her reputation. And Gloriosa allowed herself to be corrupted by magic all because of petty business problems. And not only that, the film practically lampshades that she should have considered a fundraiser from the very beginning. Just how stupid can one possibly be? Like I said, Daisy has bigger tits and less brain cells than Uma Furman. Sometimes people don't think straight when they're worried, Zack. I'm sorry, but that does not excuse her behavior in the slightest. She should have been arrested for endangering human life, but instead, she's allowed to run Camp Everfree like nothing happened. Oh yeah, did I mention how annoying her voice is? I happen to like Gloriosa Daisy. Oh. Oh, no, not again! Hey, this thing actually works! Okay, that's enough chatting about her. It's giving me a headache over here! Good idea, Rachel. Let's move on. Yeah, but mostly because I don't want to spend one more second looking at Poison Fake V. Okay, so, who's next on the EQG list? Jennifer Montage. Matt, why don't you give that brat a shredding? Gladly. First of all, she wanted to star in a new movie being filmed, but she was turned down due to being too young and having no acting experience. Does she shrug it off and move on with her life? Unfortunately not. She blames the Human 7 for something she brought upon herself and then traps him in a mirror and we're expected to forgive her just because she doesn't have friends? Just... No! I don't care if you have zero friends, this behavior is not excusable in any way, especially if you bring your own problems upon yourself. No wonder the fandom hates her so much. Wow, how often do the two of you actually agree on something? It all depends on the subject. And you know something else? Clarissa and Jennifer pretty much vanish after their debut stories, making their dungeon arcs pointless. Why even bother doing it if they're never going to appear again? I can understand why Tempest Shadow hasn't returned since Emily Blunt is an expensive actress. Well, I'm gonna have to agree with Zack on both. Juniper was awful, and Gloriosa wasn't good either. Doggone it. Sorry, Matt. Uh, it's not your fault. Certain characters are just not meant to be liked by everyone. Well, at least someone's on the same page as me, eh, Matty? Juniper, I also hate her like you do. Gloriosa, however, I still like her. Uh, well, I may agree with you on Gloriosa and Juniper, Zack, but I... Uh... Yes? I... I... I like friendship games. I see. It's inoffensive, I suppose. Much better than Legend of Everfree overall. Got that right. But even that is better than the next EG entry. I'm gonna need a root beer when this is over. Forgotten friendship. The second best of the Equestria Girl specials. I can't say much on this one. In fact, I've only seen when Sunset gets back to Equestria to see Celestia, and I think it could have been done better. 
Wait, wait, Rachel, stop! I'm not mad! Just surprised. Matt, what the hell were you thinking? I was only shocked when Rachel said the reunion between Sunset and Princess Celestia could have gone better. Well, guess what? I actually agree with her on that, but you should be ashamed for tearing her views down like that. I... I didn't mean to. I guess I should learn to control my impulses better. No crap! If you'll excuse me, I think I'll take a break from this discussion. I hope Rachel's doing okay. Uh, Zack? I'm back. Are you feeling better? I think so. I don't really take all the shouting. Well, you won't have to worry about that happening again. I'm done with the discussion. But we're not even done yet. We've yet to go through Wallflower Blush, Vigenette Valencia, and goodness knows how many more there are. Think about it. You hate Wallflower Blush. I like her. And now I'm afraid that if Rachel says something, I might explode again. Oh dear, Matt, it's okay. I, I should have realized you weren't upset with me. Well, anyway, I could say I hate Wallflower Blush and move on, but that isn't my style. I don't say I hate this thing or that person for no reason. I know. And I suppose I'd better hear the reasons why you don't like her. <sighs> I'm ready too, Zack. Okay, first off, there is Wallflower Blush's motivation. She feels neglected and wants to be noticed. Fair enough, it's something many can relate to, but she erased awkward moments she didn't like with the Memory Stone and then blames it all on Sunset for no reason. What did Sunset do to deserve that? Nothing! Also, Wallflower solely targets Sunset when she could have targeted literally anybody else at Canterlot High, but what is she hoping to gain from erasing everybody's good memories of Sunset? She's actually making things worse for herself in the long run, so any chance Wallflower has of making herself sympathetic becomes non-existent, and all memories that she erased prior to the special are gone forever, and she gets away with emotionally hurting Sunset. I'm not pulling this out of my ass or reinterpreting her character, that is literally what Wallflower did to Sunset. Also, so, this is petty, but her design is tacky. Wallflower Blush is a mind-raping hypocrite, but you know the worst thing about her? She makes autistic people look bad. That is unacceptable. A base-breaking character at most. There are fans who still like her, and I'm one of them. I haven't seen the entire Forgotten Friendship or what Wallflower Brush is like, so I can't really take sides here. But Zack makes a lot of good points, and if Matt still happens to like her, that's okay. If everyone likes the same things, it can be really boring. Now, is there anyone else in EG I haven't mentioned yet? Oh, I had a feeling we were gonna bring her up. On the plus side, I think she's the last of the bunch, Zack. If it makes you feel any better, Zack, I'm not too big on our mem-loving gal. Which is a problem with Vigenent? She's a stereotype. An awful stereotype on celebrities using social media. She's not the worst of EG villains, but she is by far the most annoying. Not only that, how did that rather suggested video of hers make it onto a kid's cartoon for crying out loud? BYBB? How about this? Bitch Denkin, S I U H A! <sighs> okay, I guess what Zach's trying to say here is that the film redemption in Equestria Girls only really worked once. The sad thing? It worked too well. 